All right, so can everyone see that? Yeah, uh, you can see okay, it. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Brian and Katie, for the invitation. Uh, and thank you also, Brian, for the very nice introduction. Uh, everyone uh, who has uh, tuned in, thank you very much. Uh, and since I've already gotten all of my vacuum related jokes out of the way, uh, most of them, uh, I will skip straight to the actual talk that you are uh, here to listen to. And that is about cosmic rays. So to begin, I'd like to discuss a little bit of background on cosmic rays and specifically the history. Uh, so we'll start with a little history lesson, specifically on the discovery of cosmic rays. So to begin, uh, cosmic rays were first detected very much by accident by Theodor Wolf. Now Theodor Wolf was interested in testing experimentally a theory at the time, which was that radioactivity was a property of terrestrial materials. And so based on that theory, he decided to test it by taking measurements of uh, ion fluxes uh, from radioactive uh, interaction between uh, air molecules, for instance, and uh, these energetic particles. Uh, and so he went to the tallest building in the world at the time, which was the Eiffel Tower, and he took measurements at the bottom. Well, then uh, he took measurements at the top in order to see if the number of ion pairs uh, per unit time went down. And in fact, he discovered something quite unexpected, which was that unlike what you would expect if radioactivity was merely a property of terrestrial uh, material, uh, the ion fluxes basically were about the same. Uh, and so he speculated that in addition to whatever source of radioactivity was coming from terrestrial materials, there was also some that was coming from space. Now, unfortunately for him, uh, this theory was not well received at the time when he first published his paper, uh, except by a few people, one of whom was uh, Victor Hess. And he decided that he would actually extend uh, Theodor Wolf's uh, work by taking measurements at even higher altitudes than what you would get to by climbing the Eiffel Tower. And so what do you do in the early 1900s? You go up in a balloon, uh, and which is what he did. You can see that here. Uh, and he took a version of Theodor Wolf's electroscope with him. Uh, interestingly, uh, I'm in Munich. One of these electroscopes used by Victor Hess is actually on display in the Deutsches Museum. So you can see that if you visited. So he went up in a balloon uh, to five kilometers and took measurements. And what did he find? Well, he found uh, this. So you can see that here, uh, with altitude, the number of ion pairs that he measured uh, increased dramatically. So this was really conclusive evidence that there was some source of ionizing radiation coming from space. But even later, uh, his experiment was followed up in turn by that of Kohlhurster, who went even higher, as you can see, and the trend continued. And so this really indicated that there was some, again, form of ionizing radiation coming from space, and it set off a, uh, fevered hunt for the identity of these mysterious uh, particles. Uh, now, Robert Millikan, uh, more famous for measuring the charge of the electron, had a lot to say about this mysterious cosmic radiation. Uh, he was convinced that uh, it was con uh, consisted of photons, and so he actually is the one who coined the term cosmic ray. Now, unfortunately for Robert Millikan, this was not the case. As shown later by Bruno Rossi, uh, these uh, cosmic rays were actually charged particles. And he was able to determine this by using uh, the so-called cosmic ray telescopes. Now what these were were basically frames that contained Geiger counters uh, pointed in opposite directions. And by taking measurements at different points, different places, over the Earth, he was able to determine that, in fact, these cosmic rays were being deflected by the Earth's magnetic field, thus the, the conclusion that they were not photons, but charged particles. Now, 
his findings were later uh, generalized by Georges Lemaitre, who really uh, took it and formed the first general picture of what cosmic rays actually were. Now, Georges Lemaitre did, worked in areas other than cosmic rays, and if you've heard his name, it's probably because he's the one who came up with the idea that was later called the Big Bang. So, what are cosmic rays? Well, they are 90% protons uh, with about 9% helium nuclei and 1% HZE nuclei, where that stands for high atomic number and energy. And it's thought that these cosmic rays are formed both in supernovae as well as in what are called active galactic nuclei, which are basically the regions at the centers of galaxies around supermassive black holes. So this is where we think they come from. There's a little bit more uncertainty about what their energies are. So here are three predictions. So you can see that at energies above about a GeV, these three different predictions agree fairly well. And the reason for that is that, in fact, we can measure the galactic cosmic ray flux fairly well at those energies. And so there's not so much uncertainty there. But as you can see, at lower energies, these different predictions diverge wildly. And that's because, due to the effects of the sun, we can't actually measure uh, directly galactic cosmic ray flux with those energies. So in fact, this is an area of active research still, uh, but this just gives you an idea of some of the predictions that have been made. All right, so I've told you a little bit about what cosmic rays are and how they were discovered. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about what they do, uh, specifically in the interstellar medium. Well, I'm going to talk to you about two broad classes of inelastic processes throughout this talk. And here we'll start with the first one, ionization. So cosmic rays as a form of ionizing radiation, indeed as the name indicates, can ionize things. And this ionization is very important uh, in this case for driving the formation of polyatomic molecules. As was shown by Herbst and Klemperer in 1973, this formation uh, of polyatomic molecules really starts with H3+, which itself is formed via the ionization of H2, the most abundant molecule in the universe, by a cosmic ray. You get then H2+, and an electron. That H2+, can collide with H2 and give you H3+, plus H. Now, again, it's this H3+, plus that is extremely important for the formation of even larger species. So here's just an example. This is shown here, primitive organic chemistry. So you start with the H3 plus, and upon collision with a carbon atom, you get CH plus plus H2. Now that CH plus can collide again with H2, and you get CH2 plus. Uh, once more, and you get CH3 plus. So this gives you the idea. Uh, so starting with H3 plus, now you can see polyatomic molecules forming the beginnings of organic chemistry. All right, so this is ionization. The other major important class of inelastic collisions uh, are the excitative uh, collisions. So here again, going back to H2, uh, this is also a very important process in the ISM, particularly in this case in molecular clouds. So here you see uh, molecular hydrogen uh, upon an excitative collision uh, with a cosmic ray, uh, it can actually emit uh, a Lyman or Werner band UV photon as it relaxes back down to the ground state. So this process is very important because it, it generates an internal UV flux in the cloud. Uh, and again, this is important because in these molecular clouds, the external UV photons are fairly quickly extinguished. And so, this internal flux of UV photons is really critical for driving processes that otherwise wouldn't be able to occur in the generally cold environments of these dense molecular clouds. All right, so I've talked about molecules in the gas phase. What else is there in the ISM? Well, let me show you a picture of it. So here we have a picture uh, taken by my uh, friend and collaborator, Brett McGuire in Charlottesville, Virginia. And 
So you might be asking yourself, what region of the sky is this? Well, here you have the Pleiades. Here is Aldebaran. So what region is this? But of course, the constellation Taurus. So you'll notice here this region in, uh, labeled TMC1. This is the Taurus Molecular Cloud 1, and it's a favorite target to observe uh, by many astrochemists and a favorite target to model by many modelers, including me. But you notice it's part of this larger, darker region, uh, the Taurus Molecular Cloud. Now, it's dark here, not because there are fewer stars in this region compared to, for instance, here. Rather, what you're seeing is the extinguishing of the light of the stars behind this molecular cloud due largely to dust. So dust <clears throat> is quite uh, prevalent in particular these molecular clouds, and we think it looks a bit like this. So here is an interplanetary dust grain. Now we think that interstellar dust grains are by and large like this uh, in terms of composition and morphology, uh, just quite a bit larger, as of course you can see here, uh, with the comparison with the cunningly hidden interstellar dust grain. Well, rather than make you search for it, I will highlight it. It's right there. That's the interstellar dust grain. And we think they have average radii uh, of about 0.1 microns. So that's interstellar dust. So now just to briefly go over how dust uh, aids chemistry in these regions, I will show you my very artistically drawn version of an interstellar dust grain. Now this dust grain interacts again with the surrounding gas. How so? Well, upon collision with the dust grain, some molecule from the gas phase can stick to the surface. Now you can imagine now two species absorbed onto the surface of the dust grain. And once absorbed, they can hop thermally from one side to another. And this is a driver of diffusive so surface reactions. So that if two species that can react encounter one another, you can form some new product like so. So now over time, due to chemistry like this, as well as further um, accretion onto the dust grains from the gas, you develop a coating on these dust grains. This coating is what forms the molecular ice that eventually encapsulates the dust. Now, just as with the bare dust grain, this molecular ice is very important for the chemistry. So for instance, on the surface, again, you can have similar types of diffusion processes. Now at the temperatures that you typically find these uh, ices uh, and this dust, the diffusion is really dominated by the most mobile species, which is molecular or atomic hydrogen. And so by comparison within the ice, binding energies are significantly higher. And so what this means is that chemistry that happens via diffusion would be significantly inhibited. So then the picture that emerges is that the outermost uh, few monolayers of this ice is chemically active, this region sometimes called the selvedge. And here you have reactions again dominated by uh, chemistry driven by atomic hydrogen, specifically hydrogen addition reactions, because the resulting products can uh, be stabilized by the ice. So this is one way of saturating molecules that's characteristic of grain surface chemistry. So now within the ice though, within the bulk, the picture that emerges again is that this region is much more chemically inert. If the chemistry is really driven by this diffusion, then the interiors of the ice uh, are more like reservoirs for species that are formed earlier on. So this picture though is somewhat complicated by for instance, uh, things like UV photons. Remember, these are the photons that are produced internally by cosmic ray interactions with H2. And as you see here, they interact with the dust and with the ice, particularly again with the outermost layers of the ice. 
and they help to uh, drive chemistry through photo dissociation, for instance, of ice species. But these, cos these photons are produced by interactions with cosmic rays, and of course, interactions between the ice and the cosmic rays themselves, uh, themselves is also very important. So unlike the UV photons, these cosmic rays can actually zip through the ice. Uh, and in fact, one cosmic ray can interact with many, many dust grains and ice mantles. So even though there are And so, of course, this is what I'll be talking to you more about uh, as the talk progresses. But first, I want to try to motivate to you why these sorts of interactions are interesting uh, and hopefully whip you up into a state of frenzied excitement. So I'm going to show you hopefully a very exciting picture that will get you all riled up. So here it is, this is a rock. So, having been appropriately stimulated, uh, I will clarify that this isn't just any rock. In fact, this is a fragment of the Murchison meteorite. Well, why is this interesting? Well, we'll put it on a pedestal because it's important and go into a little bit more detail. Now, if you were to analyze some of these specks within this meteorite, you would find a number of interesting things. For instance, you would find a number of amino acids. So these are the building blocks of proteins. So specifically, uh, you would find, for instance, these amino acids. Now, among living organisms, uh, they typically use predominantly only one handedness of these amino acids. So these, except for glycine, uh, are chiral molecules, which means that they have non-overlapping uh, mirror images of each other as isomers. And so, in, again, in biological organisms, one enantiomer is used almost to the exclusion entirely of the other. Now, normally, when you synthesize these amino acids, you get equal amounts of the, for instance, left and right-handed form. But it was found amongst these meteoritic amino acids that there was an excess of the biologically relevant enantiomer. This is quite startling. Uh, and I should say that uh, it's not entirely clear how this happens, but it seems that this is a real uh, phenomenon, that there is an excess of the biologically relevant form. All right, well, those are amino acids, but the more popular theory about the origins of life uh, is not that proteins came first, but rather that RNA came first and RNA is built of nucleobases. So what, what treasures does the Murchison meteorite have uh, with regards to the RNA world hypothesis? Well, there are nucleobases to be found in these meteorites. Again, species like this. So what we have here are fairly complex molecules being formed somewhere in space, such that they can be extracted from meteorites like this. So I think that's quite remarkable. But let's go from, say, meteorites to a somewhat different planetary object, type of planetary objects, and those are comets. So here we have comet 67PCG, which was visited by the Rosetta mission. Now, in analyzing the material coming off of the comet, a number of interesting species were found, uh, as described in this paper. For instance, the amino acid glycine, as well as a couple molecules which might be precursors for glycine or other amino acids like ethylamine and ethylamine. So again, these are coming off of comets, and this was actually detected in space. So this is an even better confirmation that somewhere at least one amino acid is forming in space. So how, how is this happening? Well, there's now a large body of experimental work which suggests, I think, a very likely uh, mechanism for how these molecules could have gotten there, and that is the bombardment of low temperature ices by ionizing radiation. So here's one representative paper. Uh, here in this work, they took a mixed ammonia acetic acid ice and bombarded it with electrons, and lo and behold, they get, among other things, 
glycine. So, very nice, but the question is, is this actually going on in space? Well, let's review what we have. We have dust, and this dust is covered with ice. So we have the ice part of it down. Now again, this dust is undoubtedly bombarded by cosmic rays. And so we have not only mixed ices, as you might uh, find in one of these experiments, but you also have a form of ubiquitous ionizing radiation. So this ionizing radiation, as in the experiments, would break apart molecules uh, within the ice and form, for instance, radicals. Now these radicals could, in one way or another, eventually react to form what we would call comms. So comms are complex organic molecules, and for instance, the amino acids and the other prebiotic species we've talked about would be classed as comms. But now we want to talk about how exactly is the ionizing radiation changing the composition of the ice? How is it driving the formation of these comms? So let's just zoom into a small region of the ice. Again, this is my very artistic representation of a dust rain ice mantle. And what we're going to do now is go through step by step uh, the various stages that occur when such an ice is bombarded by a particle of ionizing radiation. And we'll break it down into three acts. So let's start with act one. Act one is the physical stage. So it's here in this very fast uh, period of time that you have within the ice species being ionized and excited. All right, so here's a cartoon version of what's going on. Here we have pictured by the blue block, a, an O2 ice, a pure O2 ice. Now you might be asking yourself why it's a pure O2 ice and that should become obvious later on. Now imagine this pure O2 ice being bombarded by, in this case, an energetic proton, typical again of cosmic rays. So as you see here, the cosmic ray, as it's moving through the ice, can ionize, in this case, the O2, to form O2 plus and an electron. Now this electron here is referred to as a secondary electron, and specifically a first generation secondary electron. Moving down, the primary ion, as we'll call this proton, can also excite things. So just as in the gas phase with H2, so also in solids here with O2. So I said this is a first generation secondary electron. So these secondary electrons are very important for propagating the effects of the primary ion in the material. So for instance, the secondary electrons can further ionize species, forming, in this case, what's known as a second generation secondary electron. And just as with the primary ion, in addition to ionizing things, they can also excite species. More than that, even, uh, after they fall below the excitation energy threshold, they can still do interesting things like dissociative electron attachment in this case. And so this gives you a rough idea in cartoon form of what we call the track. So again, the track consisting of the path of the primary ion, as well as the paths of all of the secondary electrons through the material. So this physical stage is then followed by the physico-chemical stage. So here you have the recombination of charged species, uh, particularly in condensed matter. These are formed quite close to one another. And so many of them do recombine. And this plus just direct excitations results in some number of species dissociating. Now, in solids near the solid vacuum interface, you also have sputtering, where species are uh, elastically uh, scattered into the gas phase. So this is the physico-chemical stage, and it's followed by the slowest of these stages, the chemical stage. So it's here where really you finally can do chemistry with all of the reactive fragments and radicals that you've made earlier. And this is where these complex organic molecules will be forming. So 
a reasonable question you might have at this point is how do these calms form in the ice? Well, I'm going to delay answering that question because there's a little bit of uncertainty here and we'll talk about it a little bit more later. So just uh, we'll put this on the back burner for now and switch gears to talking about how can we actually model these interactions between cosmic rays and dust grain ice mantles. So this is the thing that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And before I talk about it though, I want to give you a little bit of a background on the kinds of models that we use just to help, uh, help give you an idea of how we've been able to incorporate radiation processes in them. So there are two main types of models, in fact, that we use. Uh, there are Monte Carlo models, and then there are models that use rate equations, rate-based kinetic models. So let's start with Monte Carlo models. So these involve generating lots of random numbers. There are, are many different types of them. Uh, the type that we typically use uh, is referred to as a continuous time random walk type model. Now the advantage of Monte Carlo models generally is that they lend themselves very nicely to simulating detail uh, at the microscopic level. So atomic and molecular scale processes, they're particularly good for that. But now as you may be able to intuit, uh, they're fairly computationally expensive and so they're slow. Now what this means is that we don't typically use these Monte Carlo models for simulating full interstellar environments. Rather, the, the real workhorses of astrochemical modeling are these rate-based uh, models. So they're also fairly simple in conception. Uh, for every X species in our network, and we have uh, usually thousands of species in our network, uh, we consider the change in their abundance uh, with time as a function of the production and destruction reactions for each of these species. Of course, this results in a network of cou coupled differential equations, uh, which we turn into a linear algebra problem. Now, the good thing is that computers are quite good at linear algebra. And so these models tend to be fairly fast. And that means that we can use them to simulate whole interstellar regions, uh, integrating uh, so that the model covers uh, astronomical time scales, typically 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, or longer. Uh, years. The disadvantage is that due to the nature of uh, this particular type of model, they're better for simulating gas-based processes than the kinds of processes on grains where, which are more stochastic in nature uh, and where you have smaller numbers of uh, species typically. And in fact, adding even fairly trivial surface processes to these codes uh, can be quite difficult but they're typically what we use. And so we usually have to find one way or another to, to make them work for us. And so that's what I'll talk about now, starting with how we've been able to incorporate these radiation-driven processes in Monte Carlo models. And so first I'll talk about a Monte Carlo model I wrote from scratch, Cirrus. Uh, which we described in this paper, which came out now a few years ago in PCCP. Now CIRRUS stands for the Chemistry of Ionizing Radiation in Solids. And it's a, again, a microscopic model that, as far as I know, for the first time, combines both the uh, physics that allows you to describe the formation of the track with a consideration of chemistry uh, over more than just a fraction of a second. So indeed, we can simulate, as you'll see, entire experiments with this code. So it is a kinetic Monte Carlo type model uh, for those who would be interesting, and again, relies on the calling of many, many random numbers. <clears throat> Here is the rough algorithm of the model, and I won't walk you through it, except to say that we consider uh, in various parts of the code, for instance here, both the chemical stage uh, as well as the faster physical and physical chemical stages. So in developing the model, as an initial test, we didn't want to start by simulating 
an interstellar environment because these are uh, even the physical conditions in them are not well constrained uh, and sometimes known to at best an order of magnitude. And so what we wanted to do rather is to simulate directly an experiment. And so we decided to simulate the bombardment of a molecular oxygen ice by 100 keV protons. So here's where the O2 ice comes in. Now, when you do this, you make ozone, O3. Now, uh, appropriately for this uh, particular talk, uh, this experiment was done at 5 Kelvin under UHV conditions. And the ice in the experiment was about 10 microns thick. So now, uh, this 10 microns number, keep it, uh, keep it uh, uh, in mind because it will come up later. Uh, but this is what we started uh, in doing with this code. So here is a plot showing a track. Now, admittedly, it's not very impressive, but this is actually the first plot uh, of a track that I was ever able to generate using this code. As a graduate student, I was quite pleased with this. Uh, what it's showing is you can imagine a proton of 100 keV colliding with the surface, which is here. And each of these points uh, along this path of the primary ion then represents a collision with uh, an oxygen molecule. So again, not very impressive as a start, uh, but we've been able to do a somewhat better job at visualizing these tracks since then. And so here's a bit better of a picture of what it looks like. All right, so what is this showing? Well, here's what we have. What we have is here a dust grain. Being a theorist, of course, I made the dust grain spherical. Uh, surrounding the dust grain, there is an ice mantle shown here. And you can imagine the cosmic ray proton entering the ice mantle here. And thus what you see in red is the track of both the primary ion, the proton here, as well as the secondary electrons. And along these paths of the secondary electrons, you'd have species, in this case, water, being dissociated. All right, so let's take another view of the track in all of its three-dimensional glory. So here it is. All right, so you can see that most of the secondary electrons are actually stopped within some radius from the path of the primary ion. So in fact, this is why uh, analytically these tracks are often represented as cylinders. You can see though that it's not entirely uh, an accurate representation because there are some electrons whose paths uh, exceed the radius of this cylinder uh, in which you find most of the electrons stopped. So these more energetic electrons are referred to as delta rays, but generally you, you can see that a cylinder is not a horrible approximation for the track. So moving on, let's talk a little bit uh, about the chemistry, switching gears from the physics. So why did we choose the O2 system? Well, because it's about as simple a system as you could imagine in terms of radiation chemistry. So this gives you some idea of why. You can imagine the main constituent of the ice, in fact, the uh, sole constituent of the ice in, at T equals zero, molecular oxygen. And upon interaction with either the proton or a secondary electron, here we'll call it X, it can dissociate to form two oxygen atoms. Similarly, as you start to make ozone, the ozone can be dissociated as well into, in this case, atomic and molecular oxygen. In terms of reactions, the molecular oxygen can react with atomic oxygen to give you ozone. And similarly, ozone can react with atomic oxygen to give you molecular oxygen again. So it seems fairly simple. You have here three species. O, O2, and O3. But when we looked at it with our detailed Monte Carlo model, it got a little bit more complicated. So here, 
you can see the network that we used ultimately in the Monte Carlo code. And it's more complicated because we're dealing with, in this case, also ions as well as uh, higher excited states. And so this, of course, expands the complexity of the network. But in some sense, it's important. But first I wanted to just show you the results that we got in this preliminary paper. Uh, so here uh, we see a comparison between the Cirrus model uh, data and the experiment. So the experimental data points are shown in blue. And on the x-axis here is the fluence. The fluence being the product of the flux and the time. And it tells you approximately how many ions you've smashed into your, uh, into your system. The y-axis here is the ozone concentration. So notice we have three different curves representing three different model runs here. And the one which best reproduces the experimental data is the 10 micron uh, ice that we simulated. We were very happy about this because as you will recall, the experimental ice was also 10 microns. So you can see that not only do we uh, recover this information, but we are also doing a pretty good job with reproducing, for, for instance, in this case, the steady state abundance of ozone. So we were quite happy about that. But again, I've mentioned that these Monte Carlo models, though very useful, are not the workhorses of astrochemistry. In fact, uh, we use primarily rate equation based models. And so what we wanted to do was take what we learned from the Monte Carlo simulation and try to incorporate it into these uh, standard astrochemical codes. So we looked around to see if there was an appropriate way of doing so, and unfortunately we didn't find one. So we had to come up with one. And so that's what we did as described in this paper. Uh, this was also in PCCP, but this time in a special issue on theory, experiment, and simulations in laboratory astrochemistry. Uh, and actually, you're now familiar with the design on the back cover. So before going into detail about the general method we came up with, uh, let me just motivate it by going back to O2. So again, you can think of O2 broadly uh, as upon interaction with a proton or secondary electron, is dissociating into two oxygen atoms. But when you think about it in more detail, actually the products, at least the energetic state of the products, depends on how you are dissociating the, in this case, molecular oxygen. If the oxygen is uh, excited on collision uh, directly, then you can imagine it dissociating into, in this case, predominantly ground state products. However, the products are much more likely to be in some higher electronic state if it's dissociating as a result of, for instance, a recombination between an O2 plus ion and an electron. So the, again, energetic state of the products uh, depends in some sense on how you're arriving at them. So we wanted to preserve this information somehow, not just for O2, but for every species in our network. Uh, at least in the grain surface network. And we were so concerned about the energetic state of the products because it's particularly important for accurately reproducing chemistry at low temperatures, which is uh, for these ice mantles, uh, what you have in the ISM. So here's an example, again, going back to the O2 system uh, of the reaction between ozone and atomic oxygen. So here I'm showing the reaction with the ground state triplet P oxygen as well as with the excited singlet D atomic oxygen. You'll see that the reaction with the ground state atomic oxygen has a significant barrier. So what this means is that this reaction is not going to occur very efficiently uh, at uh, temperatures that you would typically find uh, astrophysical ices at, and especially in the experiments that were at, for instance, five Kelvin. However, if you have singlet D oxygen instead, this reaction is barrierless. So understanding the energetic state of the product, or of the reactants in this case, makes a difference between this reaction either not going at all effectively or being quite efficient. So we wanted to preserve this information somehow. So we came up with this three-step process. Uh, and now I'll walk you through each of these steps in a little bit more detail. 
So let's just start with a consideration of the elementary processes. So here you can imagine any species in our network, A, uh, interacting with again some particle of ionizing radiation. And just as we've been describing, it can be either ionized or excited. Now, especially in condensed matter, you can imagine a significant fraction of those charged species recombining. And in the limit of complete ignorance, we assume that the products of those recombinations are electronically excited. Similarly, for species which have been excited collisionally, uh, you can imagine some fraction of them dissociating into, again, if we have no other data, you assume ground state products. Now, this is merely a starting point uh, as we do have for instance, experimental data on these processes, we can uh, expand these uh, uh, set of reactions and make it more re accurate. But this is our starting point. And the next step is then for each of these to calculate the radiochemical yield, the so-called G values, which tell you for every 100 EV that you put into your system, how many species are created or destroyed. Now, in our derivation, uh, we were able to come up with a way of doing this without, uh, that didn't rely on information for each species that was difficult to obtain or at least estimate. Uh, and so that's really the last step before you can start plugging these into your model, because once you have the yields, then you can easily calculate the rate coefficients with every other parameter in this formula being uh, something that is characteristic of the source and not of each species being dissociated. So this is the three-step process. But let's finally get back to this challenge that I've been mentioning throughout the talk. Uh, now, just to jog your memory somewhat, recall that again on the surface, we think that chemistry is predominantly occurring by diffusion. So again, imagine you have two species, they hop, and if they encounter one another, they can form a product. So what about in the bulk? How is actually the chemistry occurring here? Well, the standard view is that it's very much like what's happening on the surface, but just again, slower, because as I mentioned, the binding energies are higher. So here's a picture of that. Imagine you have some species uh, in the bulk of the ice, some of them may be more mobile, will diffuse, and again, if they enter, encounter one another, they can react and form some product. So what happens though is that because this, these diffusion rates uh, on which the rate coefficients of the reactions are based are temperature dependent, uh, at low temperatures at which we're typically dealing, uh, the reaction rates are quite low. And so what this means is that you might be building up in the ice a number of very reactive species like radicals, but because they're waiting on this diffusion to react, they actually build up. And this is somewhat of a problem. Uh, and that's pointed out indirectly by the very famous work by Mayo Greenberg uh, in a very well-known paper from 1973 he described what he called grain explosions, where you build up radicals in the ice, and as you heat it up, they start to react, and because these reactions are exothermic and are releasing a lot of energy in a very short amount of time, the grain explodes. Okay. Now, what concentration of radicals uh, is sufficient to result in effectively the obliteration of the ice? Well, it's maybe not as high as you think. In fact, in this paper, he points out that the total concentration of radicals sufficient to trigger one of these explosions shouldn't be more than on the order of a percent. So in fact, this is somewhat startling for a modeler because often we predict abundances of radicals higher than that. But according to this experiment uh, and others, they really shouldn't be more than, again, on the order of a percent or so. So what's going on? Furthermore, when you again look at other experiments, uh, th these are just a couple examples that I was involved with, uh, the diffusive mechanism can't really explain how you're able to form comms fairly quickly at low temperatures in these irradiated ices. So, so what is going on here is the question. 
Well, many of you being experimentalists will probably not be surprised. In fact, you may be shouting at your computers what the answer is. It's that these species don't in fact need to diffuse in order to react. Uh, as shown again by, in this case, uh, very nice work by Bennett and Kaiser, 2005, also on the O2 system, uh, very explicitly pointed out that in fact, in this case, atomic oxygen can react without having to diffuse, can react with a neighbor. And so this is a much more physically realistic explanation of how you have chemistry occurring in irradiated materials at low temperatures. So rather than saying it's like surface chemistry and slower, uh, the picture that I think fairly clearly emerges from experiments is that it's unlike surface chemistry and faster. So now models have been somewhat slow in incorporating these experimental findings, but recently we wanted to try to seriously uh, incorporate these results and, and see what it did. So I came up with a modified formula for rate coefficients that did not assume diffusion. And I won't walk you through it, except to give you an overall picture of what was involved in thinking through it. So here, imagine you have an ice. And this ice gets bombarded by some particle of ionizing radiation, and you generate radicals. Well, rather than assuming these radicals have to diffuse uh, to react, as pointed out by experiments, they're in fact surrounded by a cage of species uh, that they could likely react with without having to move at all. And so in this system, in this formula, we assume that they can do so. So here with the red-based model, uh, we actually wanted to do the same thing we did with the Monte Carlo model and directly simulate experiments rather than uh, the ill-constrained interstellar medium. So we went back to O2 and we also simulated uh, the irradiation also as well of a pure water ice, uh, both of which by protons. And this is really a cool thing to do because it allowed us to see in a way that we really hadn't before, just how accurate or uh, inaccurate, as you'll see, uh, our existing methods of thinking about condensed matter processes actually were. Uh, so this is, I think, a valuable tool, especially going forward, because we were able to directly compare three different ways of doing bulk chemistry. Here I'll call the models A, B, and C, uh, where model A is the non-diffusive model, model B is the standard like surface chemistry but slower model, and model C is sort of like model B but we can as we assume that some species can tunnel through uh, diffusion barriers. All right, so let's go back to again the formation of ozone. So this is uh, similar to the plot from the Monte Carlo model. But this time uh, you'll see the results of simulating it with the rate equations based model. So here again are the experimental data and here is the astrochemical model, not a particularly fancy model, but doing still quite a good job at reproducing the experimental data. Uh, and when you look at the abundance of atomic oxygen, quite low, which again seems to be suggested by the experiment that it won't stick around uh, very much. It will react fairly quickly. All right, so again, we can compare model A with the other two uh, ways of doing chemistry in the bulk. And you can see here that actually they don't do as well. In particular, they predict significantly higher abundances of atomic oxygen, which is likely quite unphysical. So here, the non diffusive mechanism is working best. Let's go on to water. So here, the x-axis is the same. The y-axis is now the uh, percentage of, in this case, hydrogen peroxide that we're making. So here is the experimental steady state abundance of hydrogen peroxide at 16 Kelvin. And here is the abundance at 77 Kelvin. And notice that it drops. So what does model A do, the non-diffusive model? Here's the 16 Kelvin result from the model. Here is the 77 Kelvin result. So very nicely we're able to reproduce, again, these abundances and this drop. If you look at the other two uh, simulations that we did, you see that they do less well, and perhaps more importantly, neither of them uh, 
captures this drop in abundance as the temperature increases. So what's going on here? Well, this behavior was, I think, first observed by Morn Hudson uh, in a paper from year 2000. And they uh, weren't exactly sure which reaction 